Good morning. And another welcome to you and to our viewers through technology. Thank heavens for technology. Will you please read with me responsively the litany of worship? Let us give thanks. Like a parent, God has held us. Like a parent, God has nurtured us. Our God has shown compassion and care. Please pray with me. Holy Parent, thank you for the privilege of being called your children. That privilege is your grace that is given freely to all people, even when we turn away from you. We can and do become willful, headstrong brats when we forget the lessons that you sent Jesus to teach us. Each of us find it very easy to say, I'll do it my way, and we turn away from your way. We thank you for your grace you give to us even when we fail. You are always ready to welcome us back like a lost child into the warm and loving arms of the parent that you are. We know you are forever there for us. We know this by the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Please be seated. Wasn't sure this was me. I didn't study the order of service well enough. I joked with Russ and Amy that since they weren't going to be here, it might be a good idea to mark off the back half so everybody had to sit closer up. I think maybe that would have been a good idea. (laughs) The call to confession has always been one of my favorite parts of our church service here. Um, The church I grew up didn't practice confession, maybe because it was Southern Baptist and we weren't supposed to do anything to confess to start with. But the way that we practice here in the silence together, with all our hearts and minds joined in the same intention, is a powerful and profound act of worship and prayer. I can always feel it if I allow myself to be open. So silence is a kind of prayer. It lies at the heart of all the great spiritual traditions. It invites us to be still, to listen deeply, to be present, and to know God better. It's said that prayer is keeping company with God. But how often do we run off on our own, leaving God far behind? How often do we think we have all the answers and know know how things ought to be or ought not to be? Let us keep the silence together, and in the silence, let us keep company with God.
I invite you now to join with me as we pray responsively our prayer of confession. I lift my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all harm. God will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. Even when you forget you can't do it alone and your relationship with God is neglected, even when you have forgotten whose you are, even then, know that you are loved and you are forgiven. So be at peace. Today we begin a sermon series on the Minor Prophets, which Russ has aptly called Majoring on the Minors. The obvious question is why are these 12 prophets referred to as Minor Prophets? Is it because their words were less significant to the people of Israel than the words of the major prophets, like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel? Well, no, their messages were certainly no less significant and important. Is it because they are among the most seldom read and least familiar books of the Bible? No, it's true that they are not often read, but that's not the reason we call them minor. Though let me ask, when was the last time that you sat down and opened Obadiah Habakkuk, or Zephaniah. In fact, I can't say this with any certainty, and I saw on Facebook that Russ and Amy are watching right now, but I think it's quite possible that in 22 years, they have avoided preaching on the Minor Prophets. Now, I'm not suggesting that they planned their El Camino pilgrimage to avoid Hosea, but while well, they are in Spain today. So why are the minor prophets called minor? The simple reason that they are called minor prophets is that all 12 books could be contained on one single scroll. Individually, the books are just not very long, hence minor. When we hear the word prophet, a common misunderstanding is to think of fortune tellers or people who see into the future. While the prophets do sometimes speak of the future, most of their message was addressed to what was happening then and there at that time in the life of the Hebrew people. Prophets 
were Israelites who had a radical encounter with God and then felt called to, to deliver a message from God to the people. Prophets speak to the people on behalf of God. Priests, on the other hand, speak to God on behalf of the people. To understand the prophets, we need to remember a few things about God's dealings with the Israelites. Going back to Abraham, you'll recall that the Israelites are God's chosen people. But chosen for what purpose? In God's blessing to Abraham, the last line is, and all of the families of the earth will be blessed through you. They were chosen to be a blessing to the nations and to represent God's character, God's justice, love, and generosity to the nations. Another crucial episode in Israel's history occurred at Mount Sinai. God rescued God's people out of bondage in Egypt and then entered into a covenant and agreement with them at Mount Sinai. I will be your God and you will be my people. God said, if you obey me and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. And the next part is important. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. As a kingdom of priests, the Israelites were to serve as mediators, reconciling the nations to Yahweh. Even though the prophets appeared much later on the scene in Israel's history, five, six, seven hundred years after Mount Sinai, they were shaped and formed by what took place early on when the covenant with Israel was first established. To understand the prophets, you must understand what happened at Mount Sinai. God gave the Ten Commandments. Israel promised to be God's faithful covenant partner. And God said, if you will obey, you will be blessed. And did the Israelites obey? No. It's not long before they are, are attempting to reduce God to an idol, the golden calf. More convenient because the golden calf has no expectations or requirements. The story of Israel is a story of constant tension, back and forth between being faithful to the covenant and being lured away by wealth, power, and idols. And then along came the prophets. The prophets accused Israel of violating the terms of the covenant, of idolatry, of trusting alliances with other nations rather than trusting Yahweh, and of allowing injustice to the poor. They called Israel to repentance and they talked about the consequences of breaking the covenant. The day of the Lord, when the land would dissolve into chaos with no light, no animals, no people. Dramatic cosmic imagery to describe the exile of the Israelites to Babylon. Were the prophets popular in their day? Hardly. They were mostly marginalized and disregarded by the religious and political leaders of Israel. But these books of the prophets were later included in scripture because they told the story of Israel. They told the story of Israel's failure and exile. What's amazing is that the story always concluded with hope and restoration for the Israelites because of God's tremendous compassion. Is there a lesson in Habakkuk or Hosea or Zephaniah for us today? Well, aren't we struggling still 
with some of these same issues, wanting to be faithful to God, to work for justice, to live righteously, and to serve the poor, yet continually drawn in by the glitter, the golden calf, or whatever various idols happened to be consuming us at the time. Brueggemann says that what he refers to as the great if, if you obey, you will be blessed. The great if is still the condition in which we find ourselves today. May it be so. No doubt if Russ were here to be giving this introduction to the book of Hosea, he would have a lot more to say about what was going on in Israel at the time, being the Bible history nerd that he is. That's supposed to be a joke, that part. <laughs> Sorry, Russ. But since, since he's not here and I'm no Bible scholar, I had to rely on Google and YouTube posts for my history lesson. And you can thank me later for the short and simple synopsis. So the history part, Hosea lived in the northern kingdom about 200 years after they had broken off from southern Judah. Hosea had been called to speak on God's behalf during the reign of one of Israel's worst kings ever, Jebediah, no, I'm sorry, Jeroboam II. I mean, that's the only name dropping I'm gonna do because obviously I'm gonna embarrass myself with pronunciations. Um, the nation was descended into chaos, and in the year 720, the kingdom of Assyria swooped in and decimated Israel. Hosea had seen all of this coming. So the book is a collection of some 25 years of his preaching and teachings. Most of it is poetry, which helps me understand why it's hard to understand, because, you know, poetry is full of imagery and symbolism and similes and metaphors and all that poetry stuff. <clears throat> so we'll just say that Israel had lost some of its good standing. Sound familiar? The book begins with God telling Hosea to find and marry an adulterous woman. So some interpretations call her a prostitute, some a harlot, it really doesn't matter what wording you use, but she was not the type of woman that a parent would most likely want their child to marry. So you can't help but wonder why God asked Hosea to do this. Was it shock factor or to get our attention? I can say that I was pretty surprised. But anyway, Hosea goes on and does as God has told him to do. He marries a woman named Gomer and they have three children together, but she continues to be unfaithful to him. Last week in our Bible study group, the question came up, well, if she was unfaithful, how did Hosea know they were his children? Good question, but not what's important in the story. What's important is that even though Gomer had been unfaithful, maybe had children with another man, Despite all of that, Hosea is told to go and find her, to pay off her debts, and to commit his love to her once again. So all this, the broken marriage, the repaired marriage, the children, all their crazy names that mean stuff that you'll have to go read Hosea yourself if you want to know their names. Um, all of this is a prophetic symbol telling the story of God's relationship to Israel. And of course, as the minor prophets are relevant to us today, God's relationship with all of God's children. So in the story, God is like a faithful husband who's rescued Israel out of slavery, brought them to Mount Sinai where they entered into a covenant and promised to be faithful to God alone. But as Dan said, they took all the abundance that God had given them and they devoted it to the worship of the Canaanite god Baal. So, you see, God had a reason to break his covenant with Israel. 
just like Hosea had a reason to divorce Gomer. And God thinks pretty seriously about this, but instead decides to pursue Israel again and renew the covenant with them. And the reason God is willing to do this, the book of Hosea says, is purely because of God's own love, compassion, and faithfulness. So the main points are that Israel has rebelled, God's going to bring severe consequences, but God's own covenant of love and mercy are more powerful than Israel's sin. So the majority of the rest of the book of Hosea is about what you might expect from a prophet, major or minor. It's all the punishment God's going to bring down on Israel, the consequences they're going to suffer for their rebellion and unfaithfulness. It's all a lot of that. A bunch more symbolism and imagery and stuff, you know, the poetry thing. The final words of the book are actually probably not from Hosea, but more likely from someone who collected all of Hosea's poems into the book of Hosea. Whomever that person might be, what they wanted us to know is that Hosea's ancient poetry to Israel is not locked in the past. It reveals deep truths about God's character and purposes and also about human nature truths that are relevant and pertinent to our lives today. God's desire is to heal and repair the brokenness of the human heart so that we can receive God's love and in return, love God. This is what God promises to do. And according to sources more knowledgeable than me, that's what the book of Hosea is all about. Now, I did learn one interesting little bit of trivia while I was reading up on Hosea, not unlike Dan's comment about bi-monthly. Um, when Hosea talks about the reason why Israel was unfaithful, he says that it's because they lack all knowledge and understanding of God. So the Hebrew word for knowledge in this context is yada, Y-A-D-A. And yada, one of the things about Hebrew that, you know, they, like a lot of other languages, they have multiple words for different kinds of knowledge. So this kind of knowledge, it's not your intellectual activity. It's the kind of knowledge that's personal and relational. So the fellow doing the YouTube video said it's the difference between knowing about somebody and knowing somebody, actually spending time with somebody. So to me, I hear that God wanted Israel then and all of God's children now to know him or her. You know, the pronouns can be a little bit difficult sometimes. But he wanted to be in a relationship. God wanted us all to experience and know his love. And for that kind of knowledge, yada, to transform our hearts and minds so that we could love God in return. This is just coming from me, but that says to me that God maybe kind of needs our love. Maybe not the same way, same way that we need God's love, but in some sort of way that for me is worth contemplating.
Our scripture passage comes from the 11th chapter of Hosea today. These are God's words spoken to the people of Israel through the prophet Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst and I will not come in wrath. You have heard the ancient story. I don't know about you, but the scripture passage we just read doesn't sound to me anything like what I would expect from any prophet of God who is worth his salt. Aren't the prophets supposed to be accusing the Israelites of idolatry and warning them against God's impending judgment? Instead, Hosea has God saying, how can I hand you over, Israel? My, my compassion grows warm and tender. I will not come in wrath. Well, just so you know that he's got it in him, Hosea, a bit earlier in the book, accuses Israel of having no faithfulness, no love, and no acknowledgement of God. God says there is only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery in your land. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law, I will ignore your children. The Lord pronounces judgment on Israel through the voice of the prophet, saying, I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. I will tear them to pieces and go away. I will carry them off, and no one will rescue them. That's more like it. Go Hosea. It's not a pretty picture. It's the God of the Old Testament spewing anger and casting judgment, just as we would expect. Am I right? Well, we'll get back to that. As Missy said in her introduction, it is impossible to talk about Hosea without mentioning God's command for him to marry an adulterous woman. His marriage to Gomer serves as an object lesson for Israel. God is the faithful husband, and like Gomer chasing after other men, Israel chases after other gods and is not faithful. Gomer has three children, and the Lord picks out their names for them. Jezreel is the name of the first son because the Lord says God will destroy Israel at Jezreel. The second child, a daughter, is named Lo Ruhama, which means not loved. And the third child is Lo Ami, not my people. 
Can't you just imagine Hosea introducing his ch children to his Israelite neighbors? Hello, this is my son Jezreel. You know, the place where God will destroy Israel. And my other two children are not loved and not my people. Not a very subtle message. No doubt, Hosea's frustration with his faithless wife lent power to his message to the faithless Israelites. I think we have a tendency with our perfect hindsight to look back and think, how could the Israelites worship idols, commit idolatry, when they knew the one true God, excuse me, the one true God who had led them out of bondage in Egypt. Well, Baal was a formidable adversary for Yahweh. The Baals are immediate gods, represented by fertile fields, jars of olive oil, and succulent smells of bread and roasting meat. In the spring, the cry Baal Shai, Baal is alive, rang through the mountains and hills of the villages of Israel, and many a Yahweh worshiper joined in, attempting thereby to ensure a bounteous crop and a satisfied family. Though Yahweh was worship, the Yahweh worship was demanded in the sacred places of Israel, more than a few Israelites hedged their bets and serenaded Baal with fervency and frequency. After all, where was Yahweh anyway? On some mountain somewhere, perhaps? But what has Yahweh done for us recently? The Exodus was long ago, and Baal is current, relevant, offering his riches regularly. Yes, Yahweh has a difficult pro protagonist in anti antagonist in Baal, and the Israelites are often led astray. In our reading for today, at the beginning of chapter 11, God uses the metaphor of caring for God's people like a parent caring for a child. God loved Israel, taught them to walk, took them in God's arms, healed them, bent down to them, fed them, and loved them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. It's a tender picture of a compassionate and loving God. And yet, the more God called them, the more they moved away and sacrificed to idols. If you, as a parent, have ever felt the anguish of a thoughtless, straying, wayward child, be assured, God knows. The Israelites have clearly broken the covenant with Yahweh. They have been unfaithful and worshiped Baal. What they justly deserve is punishment and God's wrath. Yet despite God's pain at being rejected, God expresses internal turmoil at the thought of disowning God's children. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? God asks. My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. This is no aloof, detached deity. Rather, even for God, love involves risk. The risk of rejection and pain. These verses depict the tension between divine anger and divine compassion, which the English poet John Milton in Paradise Lost would much later describe as the strife of mercy and justice in God's face discerned. 
This tension between anger and compassion is a consistent characteristic of the God of the Bible. An often repeated theological statement in the Hebrew Bible describes God as slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet by no means ignoring the guilty. These dueling tendencies are central to the very nature of God. That is, they are fundamental to God's identity. Hosea acknowledges this tension between mercy and compassion, but refuses to leave it unresolved. For Hosea, God's compassion wins out. It is the triumph of mercy over justice that is fundamental to God's identity, not the tension between these two attributes. The New Testament book of James puts it this way, mercy triumphs over, just, uh, over judgment. God can choose not to exercise his fierce anger precisely because God is God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst. Although the threat of judgment returns in subsequent chapters in Hosea, God's compassion has the final word in the book. Too often we accept the false and unhelpful dichotomy between the Old Testament God of wrath and the New Testament God of love. Hosea 11 offers a more compelling portrait of a divine tension that gradually but decisively resolves itself on the side of mercy. The God who supposedly gives us what we deserve is revealed rather as the God whose overwhelming love and tenderness makes giving us what we deserve unimaginable. The Israelites were guilty of idolatry, of being unfaithful to God's covenant, and according to Hosea, guilty too of lying, stealing, murder, and adultery. Yet in the end, God has compassion on them is this cheap grace? Is it easily one indulgent love? Should we sin that mercy may abound? No. If Hosea reveals anything, it reveals a God who agonizes tremendously over Israel's betrayal. So yes, if Israel can be forgiven, so can we. We can be forgiven for our secret sins, our broken relationships, our various idolatries. But know that there is a cost, and that cost is in the heart of God, whose steadfast love will outlast all betrayals. May it be so. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Holy God, creator of all things, heavenly father and divine mother, we pray for all your children who are hurting. There is so much pain in the world. The pain of poverty and hunger, the pain of violence and hate and war, the pain of broken families and failing health. We pray for your grace and compassion on all those who are hurting. Holy God, we pray for all your children who are afraid. There's much uncertainty and fear in the world the uncertainty of faltering political systems, the uncertainty of our physical safety, 
on the streets in our cities and neighborhoods, the fear of those who are different. We pray for your comfort and protection on all who are afraid. Holy God, we pray for all your children who are grieving. There is so much sadness and loneliness in the world. The loneliness of the loss of a loved one, the loneliness of rejection and failed relationships, the loneliness of being misunderstood. We pray for your peace on all who are grieving. A Course in Miracles teaches there are no levels of difficulty in miracles. One is not larger or greater than another. And one's loneliness or loss, one's fear or anxiety, one's pain is not larger or smaller than another in your eyes and all deserving of healing. So Holy God, we pray for a miracle. A miracle in the small things that seem minuscule up against all the ills that plague our world. And we pray for a miracle in the big things, all those things that we obviously don't know what to do about or how to change. We pray for a miracle, God, for divine intervention, for an act of your grace and healing that it right, might repair the deep brokenness and selfishness of the human heart. We pray for a miracle to set our hearts and minds right, that we might receive your love and guidance, and in the receiving, be able to love you in return, and thus begin to bring about the changes this world so sorely needs. In the words of St. Benedict, O gracious and holy God, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to see you, a heart to meditate on you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May it be so. Shalom, salam, shanti, peace.
As we sing our hymn of commitment number 25, I would invite you to come and join us, the people of God, who are following the new covenant, the agreement to follow all of us together in the way of Jesus. Would you come as we sing our hymn of commitment number 25?